Welcome everybody, and thank you so much for joining the Garrison Institute Forum series on Pathways to Planetary Health with author Tony Hiss. I'm Jonathan Rose, the co-founder of the Garrison Institute and the founder of the Pathways to Planetary Health program. Before we begin today's hour-long session, let's review a few logistical items about our gathering. We're on a Zoom webinar, so your audio and video will remain off during the duration of the webinar. Please direct any questions to the Q&A box below, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can towards the end of today's conversation. We are recording these sessions, and you have a chance to review the recordings, as well as to see the schedule of upcoming programs at garrisoninstitute.org. And we also welcome you to share these recordings with others. This interactive online event is part of a continuing series of forum discussions on pathways to planetary health. Um, and uh, this program is an outgrowth of the Garrison Institute's prior climate, mind and behavior program. Um, the Pathways to Planetary Health program uh, looks at four solutions which we think are key to restoring the planet's health. The first is half earth. The second is ecological civilization. The third is regenerative economics. And the fourth is pervasive altruism. So this talk is deeply in the heart of Half Earth. It's going to really delve into the idea of what it takes to, why we have to save half the Earth, what it takes to save it, and some of the extraordinary work that's actually happening to carry that out. So it is my pleasure to introduce our guest, Tony Hiss. Tony is the author of 15 books, and I recommend reading them all, including the award-winning The Experience of Place, and most recently, Rescuing the Planet. You're going to see this a couple of times, Protecting Half the Land to Heal the Earth. He was a staff writer for The New Yorker for more than 30 years, a visiting scholar at NYU for 25 years, and he has lectured around the world. So Tony, we are so delighted that you could join us. Tony, can you hear us? I can hear you, and thank you so much, Jonathan. It's such a pleasure to be with you um, and to talk about the subject, which is of so much concern to everyone. I'd Great. like to begin by just showing a few pictures, which I think will help uh, just bring out some of the themes in the book. Great. Can you all see that? Yes. Great. Um, the theme of this book is what's sometimes called the other environmental crisis, the biodiversity crisis. A million species of plants and animals are at risk of extinction in the near future. And this is the last male northern white rhino succumbed a couple of years ago with his devoted keeper by his side who came in for one last rub behind the ears. This is Lonesome George, the last of the Pinta Island Galapagos tortoises who died at the age of 101. Um, it's given us this word, I hope we'd hope we'd never have to coin an endling, an endling is the last of its kind, the very end of its species. Lonesome George was an endling. One of the reasons we got into trouble was because we had, were the victims of either or thinking. This is a painting that was wildly popular in the 1870s called American Progress. Progress being that young lady uh, with the golden hair and not very many clothes on, who is floating over the U.S. from east to west, bringing with her the blessings of civilization. Stagecoaches, covered wagons, railroads. I happen to love railroads, but here the idea was that it, this could only happen if we displaced what had been there before. The bison are retreating, the Native Americans are retreating, and a bear is turned to snarl helplessly. But it wasn't long after that 
that other Americans began to sense that it was possible to think beyond what was being lost to a much larger picture of what was available. And one of the first was a craggy New England forester named Benton Mackay, who in 1900, the year he graduated from college, celebrated by bushwhacking his way up Stratton Mountain in Vermont in the Green Mountains, shinnied up the tallest tree he could find. And as he was swinging from the treetops, suddenly what came over him was a sense that there was a single landscape in front of him and behind him that stretched all the way from Maine to Georgia along the rooftop of the Appalachian Mountains. He later called this a planetary feeling. 20 years later, he wrote a seminal essay proposing a footpath along the peaks of the Appalachians. And this so inspired people that within 12 years, volunteers up and down the East had created the Appalachian Trail, the beloved Appalachian Trail, 2100, and 90 miles long, passing through 14 states from Maine to Georgia. That landscape is the smallest of the landscapes on this app map, which we had made for the end papers of my book. It's the one going from top to bottom along the right hand of the continent, the Appalachian Trail, and beyond the trail itself, what was of greater concern to Mackay was the landscape around it which he called the Appalachian realm. It, we're blessed in North America by having the kind of geography that helps us keep things in our heads. On the other side of the continent, the Rocky Mountains parallel the Appalachians in the East and a Canadian activist and lawyer in the 1990s had a similar vision to Mackay's that there was a single landscape stretching north from Yellowstone National Park, the first national park in the world, all the way to the end of the Yukon, the top of the Yukon. He called it Yellowstone to Yukon and set up a group to protect this international landscape. And so far they've managed to protect about 20% of it. Then the most astonishing landscape of all in this continent, the Canadian boreal forest across the top of Canada 3,700 miles long, 1,000 miles from top to bottom. The largest and most intact wildness left anywhere in the world, at least 85% intact, and still home to its indigenous people. And at the bottom of the US is the most recently discovered hotspot, the North American Coastal Plain Biodiversity Hotspot. So these four landscapes frame the continent. And it's a good thing we're beginning to think in those larger terms because traditional ways of conserving animals and plants and other species just aren't working. And we've known that for quite some time now when it was shown that the national parks which we had set up to protect species were in fact losing populations. They weren't big enough to accommodate what the animals really needed. And as development began to encroach around the edges of them, um, the animals, if they left, couldn't get back in. So half earth, why half earth? It's the question I keep getting. Well, there are a number of reasons for it. Science has shown that many animals need at least 50% of their original habitat in order to thrive. Um, it varies a bit. Some can make do with 30%, others need as much as 70%. Um, so far, we've only protected about 15% of the continent or even less. And that according to biological math pioneered by Ed Edward O. Wilson at Harvard means we probably can only hope to protect a quarter or less of all the species. And as I said, a million are already at risk of extinction. However, as Ed Wilson was one of the first to point out, out, if we bump that up to 50%, we can hope to save 85 to 90% of all species. Not everything, but pretty close to that. Please take a moment to look into the fierce eyes of this Russian biologist, Vladimir Yovanovich Vernatsky, 
who in the 1920s really wrote the first definitive book about the biosphere, that layer of life at the edge of the earth that is the home to all species, us and everything else. It was Vernetsky who really pointed out that the, for the first time that the biosphere has an ancient history, it's at least 3.8 billion years old, if not older. It has an immensity as seen from side to side, but it also has a third dimension, its height or its lack of height. Um, most species live in a band that stretches from the bottom of the ocean up to the top of Mount Everest. And that's a distance of only 12 and a half miles or so. Um, if it were laid out horizontally, it's a distance you could drive across in 20 minutes. It's, a, it's about the length, as Jonathan was pointing out to me earlier, of Manhattan Island, um, where I live. So that means that on a good road, you could drive from one end of life to the other in only 20 minutes. We continue to find wonders and astonishing abundance in the biosphere. On the left is a spider, some Indian scientists discovered a few years ago and deliberately named Ariovixia gryffindori because they thought it looked like the sorting hat in the Harry Potter books. And if only people could see the adorable nature of this spider, they would learn to love spiders better. On the right is an African vulture that can fly so high, one of them once got tangled in the, into a jet airplane. But there's that third dimension or that lack of it, that thinness. This is the famous Earthrise photograph showing Earth rising above the horizon of the moon that astronauts captured in the, in the late 1960s and helped give birth to a whole new way of thinking about the Earth. People have, the very few people who've managed to be up above the world, almost to a person have reported that they had a new sense of the planet as a precious and vulnerable place. They call that the overview effect. I think what's now seeping into people down here, those of us who won't get above the earth, is what I would call the inner view, that same sense of the world as both inexhaustible seen from side to side and precarious seen from top to bottom. So within this context, back at the half earth blackboard, there seem to be three imperatives, three R's, retain everything that we have that's still wild, restore things that were once wilder, reconnect places that manage, we've managed to interrupt and disconnect there's this boreal forest again across the top of the continent. And its preservation, the Canadians are suddenly turning to this, is going to be assured by the indigenous populations who've been there for 10,000 years. The Canadian government is setting up a whole new set of national parks with the indigenous people who live there as the rangers of the parks. Mucklucks on the ground, they call it. And immense new protected areas will come into being because the Canadians who didn't teach, treat their indigenous people that, that much better than down here in the States that we did, but who never displaced them, they're still there to take on this new and wonderful role on behalf of the planet. People all over the country respond to places that they adore, that they treasure. And back in the 1970s, some people in the National Park Service began to draw up a list of these places and put them up on a map, which I always thought of as a treasure map. They were unprotected, but they were loved by people who were there. And the thought was that this could become a second uh, set of national parks. Uh, what are called green line parks, meaning parks that are cr created and proclaimed to be special places, but don't necessarily have to be in public ownership. The whole English national park system is based on that idea. Well, it was going to have been the great 
innovation and legacy of the second Jimmy Carter administration. Only there never was a second Jimmy Carter administration because Ronald Reagan beat him handily in 1980. However, this idea is coming back now as people come to terms with the thinness. Among bird watchers and birders, there's this phrase spark bird, meaning the bird that captured their attention at some point in their lives and wouldn't let go of them and change their whole relationship with the natural world um, for the better and for, for the rest of their lives. But it doesn't have to be a bird that pulls you in. It could be a view, it could be wildflowers in the springtime, or in the case of Benton Mackay, it could be shinnying up a, a tree on top of a mountain and being overcome by a planetary feeling. So I'm so pleased to be with you here for this conversation. And I would just like to say that during the uh, remainder of the uh, quarantine, um, there's no way to have a regular book signing, but if anyone's interested and buys the book and would like to have my signature and an inscription, send me your name and address and I would be delighted to give you this, send you this book plate as our social distancing special. Thank you, Jonathan. So Tony, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And that's a very uh, condensed uh, story about the book, but it, it, it covers many of the elements that are in it. So I want us to expand on some of the ideas that are within the book. So one of them is um, we we're talking about uh, that you just briefly mentioned in one sentence or two, the territories that species have. And um, there's some incredible stories in the book about how far species uh, go and migrate and with what incredible precision too, that they're able to kind of actually know where home is. So tell us a little more about that. Uh, one of the great advances we've made uh, in the last 50, 60 years is our ability to ask animals what it is they're up to. And this is done by putting collars on animals or little tags. And um, in the early 1990s, it became possible for the first time to collar an animal that would generate a signal that could be picked up by satellites. So you don't have to be that close to the animal to see where it's going. I mentioned Harvey Locke, who was the Yellowstone to Yukon founder, but really that initiative had a co-founder, a wolf named Pluey, uh, who was captured in a blinding rainstorm, hence the name, near Banff National Park in the early 1990s. And the biologist thought, well, she'll probably wander a few miles. Wolves were known to do that. But after a few months, when she was doing that, she seemed to disappear completely. And they thought, oh, rats, the collar didn't work. But that's science for you. Several months later, they got a signal from people in NASA down in Idaho saying, we've got your wolf on our signal that's coming in. It was the same wolf, but she had traveled all the way down to Idaho. And over the next 18 months, now that they were back in touch with her, she traversed an area 10 times the size of Yellowstone National Park through three US states and two Canadian provinces. So it was clear that our ideas of what the animals were up to was way out of date. Um, it expanded our thinking in this kind of ways that the invention of the microscope and the telescope did back in the 17th century. And it's now reached the point where this brilliant German uh, biologist um, who was studied in the States uh, has set up something called uh, Icarus, which is going to be able to take their antenna on the, uh, on the International Space Station that will be able to pick up signals from something like 300 animals simultaneously and give us an enormously expanded view of where birds and animals are and what they're up to and what they need. Uh, so this is a brilliant uh, accomplishment of modern technology, but it's also because it's being fed into 
this thirst for new knowledge is changing the way we can go about thinking about nature. Great. Yeah, it, it, the, the, you know, you discuss this idea of inner view, which is very much in alignment with the Garrison Institute. And um, I'm going to explore some other aspects of that. But um, one of is really just understanding that these, so many of these animals that we don't, that may be invisible to us are billions and billions of them are here and they're all moving and they have intricate patterns that are woven together but are also quite long. So for example, um, it's, it wasn't in the book, but when we reintroduced the wolf into the uh, Yellowstone ecosystem, a lot of changes happened. Uh, are you familiar with those? Do you wanna talk about those a little bit? Oh, yes. This was a discovery made by the, the late John Landre, uh, which he called the landscape of fear. Um, wolf had been extirpated from Yellowstone. We had old fashioned ideas about conservation when Yellowstone was set up and the and predators were considered varmints. So the last wolves of Yellowstone were eliminated by 1926 or something like that. And for the next 50 years or more, uh, the uh, prey animals, the elk reigned supreme. Um, then came the idea of reintroducing wolves and Landre happened to be on, the, on hand shortly after the first wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone and made the astonishing discovery that in the areas in the south of the park where the wolves hadn't reached, the elves were still gambling about, he said it was Disneyland for elk. But the elk behavior in the north of the park where the wolves were had radically shifted. They began avoiding the open meadows where the grass was luscious because uh, the wolves could sneak up on them through the grass and pounce on them. And they stuck to the edges of the forest. So it completely reconfigured the landscape that the elk uh, would use. Uh, Landre, as I said, called it the landscape of fear. But by withdrawing, the elk began to allow the willow shoots, the trees along the riverbanks to sprout again and they had been uh, decimated by the elk because the elk not only graze, meaning eating things below them, but they browse, meaning eating things above them. Um, and with the willow back, the beaver came back um, because the beaver build their lodges out of willows. So, and when the beavers came back, the whole riverine landscape came back uh, and the whole mix of species and the whole uh, abundance of that ecosystem went through a profound change. And it, and it wasn't that many um, wolves either. It was, it was, you know, a handful of pairs of wolves that achieved this. It was an incredible transformation of That's the right. landscape. That's right. Uh, because this whole landscape has uh, evolved um, so intricately together. Um, so I want um, uh, I want to talk about human restoration too. There's a line in your in your book where you're um, talking about Nelson Mandela and his post-apartheid commission, and you say, according to historical trauma and Aboriginal healing, a booklet put out in 2000 by Canada's Aboriginal Healing Foundation, it took Europeans four decades to heal from the social breakdowns that followed the devastating outbreak of the bubonic plague, the Black Death in the 14th century. Um, I say this because my sense is that some of the human insensitivity to the preciousness of the ecosystems in life comes from, from human trauma. And that in fact, the healings of a restoration of people and restorations of nature can also come together. I'm going to tell a very brief story, um, which is there's an amazing photographer named uh, uh, Salgado who's done these incredible pictures of migrations and human suffering and famine and drought all over the world and uh, award-winning photographs. But the process of making these photographs ultimately burnt him out. And he went back to his grandfather's farm. His grandfather in Brazil had overgrazed the farm because he brought in cattle 
to be able to sell to pay for his grandchildren's education. So it was actually the destruction of the farm that led to, so he goes to this desolate, uh, dried up, desert, desert, deserted farm, and he and his wife start planting trees. Hmm. And slowly the trees uh, reestablish the groundwater, and the groundwater then begins to, you know, bring more diversity, etc. And now it's this beautiful, it took 20 years, which is actually not that long. Oh. And it, it's now this incredible, complex, beautiful, thriving ecosystem. Um, and in the process of him restoring the land, he restored himself. And he restored his, because the people he worked with, he, he restored his faith in humanity. So it, it, the, your book has some really wonderful stories of restoration. And my sense is that trauma that you refer to that takes four generations to heal, and we are such a traumatized society, that maybe we can speed that up if we all get involved in restoration. So I'd love you to tell some stories of restoration and maybe also the people involved in the restoration. Well, I think the one that I respond to the most is the story of M.C. Davis down in the panhandle of Florida. Uh, M.C. Davis was, uh, as he liked to call himself, a dirt road panhandle guy, uh, self-made multimillionaire, actually got his start, made his first stake by playing professional poker, then became a commodities uh, broker and did very well for himself. Um, and one day in middle age, he got caught in a traffic jam uh, and disgusted, infuriated, bored, he looked around him and saw a sign on a high school billboard that said Black Bear Seminar. And he thought, well, anything's better than this. So he peeled off, went inside, and as he said, there were a couple of drunks sleeping it off and a few Canadian tourists had gotten lost and were hoping for some day old donuts. And up on the stage, two remarkable women who were talking about saving the Florida black bear, which is a subspecies of the black bear. And uh, he was mesmerized. Out of nowhere, he was mesmerized by their account. And the next day, he sent them enough money to keep their uh, outfit going for a couple of years. Uh, they were somewhat alarmed, the stranger suddenly overpowering them with a donation, and said, what are you looking for? And he said, what I'm looking for is, please, a list of the 100 most important environmental books, because I've got to get up to speed. I've been ignoring this all my life. So he took a year and he read the books. Uh, and then he realized, okay, if I'm gonna help the bear, I've got to help the land they live in, the habitat. Well, the great habitat down there had been the longleaf pine forest. This was the great landscape of the South, stretching from Virginia all the way to East Texas, which had been largely leveled right after the Civil War. Uh, just as your friend uh, family put cattle on the ranch in order to send their kids to school. After the end of the Civil War and the plantations were ruined because they could no longer compel people to work on them, they started chopping down the trees. It was the reason why Scarlett O'Hara said she would never go hungry again. And this vast forest disappeared or almost disappeared. So. MC said, well, I can start to bring it back. So he bought up at a cheap price, 51,000 acres of played out peanut farms and uh, scrub land uh, and uh, started replanting longleaf pines, 500,000 seedlings a year. By the time I caught up with him through Ed Wilson, who was a friend of his, um, it was year 13 still looked pretty scruffy, I had to tell him. And he said, but we're in year 13 of a 300 year project. Um, uh, stick around. MC actually died a couple of years later, but left enough money to keep the project going for 300, for 300 years. Uh, so it's well underway and it will connect up some patches of longleaf that have been preserved and to begin to reestablish the landscape. So I mentioned spark birds earlier. 
Okay, uh, Benton Mackay's spark bird was the Appalachian Trail revelation, but MC's revelation was as a middle-aged man uh, being caught in a traffic jam and, and suddenly finding out about the plight of back black bears. Um, it can happen to anyone at any time. Uh, and he was in a position to do something particularly uh, about it, but everyone's in a position to do something about it because so much is going on. It's almost impossible not to get involved if that's what you'd like to do. Uh, particularly because so many groups that used to look askance at each other are, are collaborating now. For instance, land protection groups and trail building groups. Trail builders were mostly interested in getting through a place, whereas the land protection people were most interested in hanging on to a place. But now they realize that they're in the same business of keeping things together, as well as providing a way for people to stay in touch with them. So there are two parts of that story we want to explore further. But first of all, talk a little bit about Ed Wilson and what he's doing about half earth and Maybe well, was, how did you good, first meet him? It was my good fortune to be able to meet Ed early on in working on this book. And this book took about 10 years to write. Uh, I had to do a few other things along the way, but Ed was already talking about, and, and he is the great champion of biodiversity, uh, as well as being probably the most prominent biologist anywhere uh, and the most knowledgeable about ants, uh, his specialty. Um, and even 10 years ago, Ed was saying, we've got to think bigger. Uh, our sites are too low. We've got to aspire higher. So he was throwing out the idea of what he would call a BHAG, a uh, big, hairy, audacious goal, meaning something that would catch people's attention, not necessarily actually happen, but at least get things started. Sometimes it does get things started and completed, as for instance, when President Kennedy said, let's put a person on the moon in this decade, and, and, and we did. Um, so in talking with Ed, I actually came up with the phrase half earth, uh, which he later ran off with and wrote a book about, but he got me started. He introduced me to MC Davis and some other people. And it's funny how the whole subject of the book has sort of caught up with itself just in those 10 years, because what was once a big, hairy, audacious goal is now something that's considered uh, not only scientifically reputable, but almost old hat. And now the Biden administration has embraced, as at least a first step, the goal of 30 by 30, of, of uh, protecting 30% of the US land and waters by the year 2030, um, as a step towards 50 by 50 which was actually another phrase I came up with once Ed, Ed was starting to use half earth. Um, and not only is this something the Biden administration has set as, as a US conservation goal, but there'll be a global meeting in Kunming, China in October at which 196 nations are expected to embrace the 30 by 30 goal. Um, so a lot's happening. It, it, it's really quite amazing the wonderful just-in-time speed that this is happening. And 30 by 30 may really be achievable. And um, so again, 30% of the United States biodiversity protected by 2030, that would certainly get us well on the way to uh, 50 by 50. The, um, and what's so wonderful about this also is that it seems to me to be nonpartisan. It seems to be something that we can all do. And we can all do it in a, a lot of, uh, in many, many places. So, um, so uh, some of the questions and uh, comments are really about uh, the urban places too. And um, so talk a little bit, so this isn't all rural, we can weave nature through and around and in our cities. So talk a little bit about, about that too. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Jonathan, because just here in the East, uh, you're in, Garrison up in the Hudson Islands, I'm down here in Manhattan. Um, to really bring Mackay's idea of the Appalachian realm into being, uh, in the first place, we have to say that in the early days, people thought, well, 
the trail is enough of a goal. And they sort of shoved aside his original idea of the realm in order to get that trail done. Well, now his successors are realizing we've done that, what's next? And the realm is next. Um, but to really uh, realize the realm, it has the potential for being the sort of vast central park of the east, uh, eastern US, meaning it's flanked by the coastal cities, uh, Washington, New York, Boston, but it's also flanked by Midwestern cities like Pittsburgh. Um, and it's got to be reach into those cities and also allow for those cities to reach out into the landscape. Um, Mackay's thought was be that people would take the trains to get to the landscape. And there is one place you can get to the Appalachian Trail on a train from Grand Central Terminal. Uh, thanks to Metro North, the commuter railroad and a former president, Metro North, um, who was a hiker, who set up a whistle stop that's open only on weekends uh, at a place in Dutchess County where the trail actually crosses the tracks. And you can get off there on a couple of trains on Saturday mornings and there's the trail at your feet and have a day's hike. And there are a couple of trains in the afternoon that'll take you back home again. But there's no reason why we can't think uh, about the landscape extending. I was part of a waterfront alliance panel yesterday in New York talking about um, the uh, need to protect the few wetlands that are still around the harbor. And suddenly we were realizing New York, the most densely settled part of the whole continent is wrapped around one of the great wildernesses of the world, namely the Hudson River, which is a mile wide there and almost a mile deep, full of extraordinary species. Thanks to the Clean Water Act, they've made a great resurgence. Now we have to start thinking, well, in the past, the Hudson was the great divider. New Yorkers sneered at New Jersey. New Jersey squabbled with New York. Now we realize that not only does it something that pulls us together, but we have in our midst this great wildness uh, and it's our job to cherish it and celebrate it and protect it. So that's a whole new way of thinking and something that English are starting to work on. Plymouth, England in the South has is, is suddenly proclaimed itself the Plymouth Sound National Marine Park, something that never existed before. And they're trying to get a whole national system going. Well, we can do that right here as a way of, uh, of reconnecting and reuniting the great Appalachian landscape and the great Hudson landscape at the same time. It's almost impossible not to come up with good ideas when you start to look at it. So actually, that's the story of the birth of the Garrison Institute. Very briefly, John Adams, founder of NRDC and the Open Space Institute, uh, and his team had, had preserved a tremendous amount of land in Phillipstown, where Garrison is, including land all along the Appalachian Trail. But they observed that the pathway from the Garrison uh, train station to the Appalachian Trail had one missing link. And that was this 91 acres that was owned and occupied by an abandoned monastery. And so they decided to buy that monastery land so as to create uh, complete the link so that you could walk from the Garrison train station to the Appalachian Trail. The only problem is it came with a building and the Open Space Institute's not allowed to own buildings. So they were seeking a not-for-profit to take the building. And uh, uh, we decided to form the Garrison Institute and take the building from them. And, and so we were born in this connection, something, uh, an effort to connect the Hudson and the Appalachian Trail. Wow, I didn't know that. That's, that's marvelous. Yeah. So, um, but by the way, about that time, you actually put out, a, I don't know if you called a book or a pamphlet called H2O. Ah, yes. Uh, that was the, the thought that a book called Highlands to Ocean H2O. Um, the idea being that the watershed of the Hudson Estuary extends up into the highlands and that despite 400 years of nonstop development, down here at the bottom of the Hudson. Um, there's still so much natural land left uh, 
within this watershed that uh, everyone who lives anywhere in the watershed can legitimately thinking of themselves as having two addresses, a street address and a place in this larger landscape. So yet there's another idea that we can uh, move forward with. So some questions. So the first one is, how do we do the vital work of land conservation while also dealing with population explosions? Well, the good news is that uh, that we, that we humans use less than 40% of the continent. So it's not as if we have to think about displacing people in order to get to 50%. Yes, we are expecting a, a large amount of further fellow citizens by mid-century. Uh, and it will mean that we have to think more carefully about where, the, where to house that next generation of people. Um, I, suddenly in Montana, they're beginning, beginning to worry about sprawl and they asked people from Oregon, which passed uh, a comprehensive uh, land planning a Republic, under a Republican governor plan uh, a generation ago to come and explain that to them. The idea of urban growth boundaries around towns uh, so that you can grow up, grow up to a certain line, but beyond that, it will remain natural or farmland. Um, that's beginning to sink in uh, in the upper Rockies and Montana. Um, but it's also, I think it's helped by cherishing where we are and, and seeing where we are. Uh, and the idea that for instance, there's really no reason to back down here and. Hudson Estuary to take e even a single more acre of wetlands out, out of the few that are left for any purposes other than just maintaining the health of the place. Um, that developers like to talk about the highest and best use of a piece of property, which sometimes means uh, what is the biggest building you can put on it. Some of these places already are at their highest and best use as natural areas. And that's beginning to sink in because there was a woman on our panel that's in desperate trouble trying to save a 60 acre wetland in Staten Island that they want to pave over and, and put up a, I forget what kind of shopping mall. Um, there is, there's so much land that's available for that to be repurposed. We don't have to take away any of the natural land that's left. Right. You know, there's a model in Singapore. So Singapore has a deep commitment to biodiversity. They were actually the host of one of the global biodiversity conventions, but also they get all their water, much of their water from Malaysia, and they want to become water independent. And they realized the only way to do that was to, they're an island nation is to capture rainwater. And to do that, they needed nature to capture it. And to do that, they realized they didn't have enough. And they realized the answer was to actually shrink the amount of land coverage. And they came up with this theory that they would only build 50 story buildings that were mixed use and mixed income. They would connect them with mass transit. They would create walkable communities around them. And then they could get rid of their roads and convert their roads back to nature. And they've actually been doing this. And what they're proving is that higher density actually allows for higher density of nature too. So it's wow. a so there really is there and we're seeing this in other cities too by the way i don't know if you've seen the plan to take the champs de Lisée in paris and turn it back into a park and so so and you know people love these every time this happens it happened with a river whose name i can't easily pronounce in in south korea and mm -hmm. every time we take nature every time we restore nature in cities mm -hmm. Um, it turns out it reduces traffic, improves air quality, brings back biodiversity, improves real estate values, and has every other way it wins. Um, so another question, we're working in DC, Washington DC, to connect people to local nature. So I love the idea of a green line park. Um, what do you think of scaling our 50% from city balcony to regional parks to the arboreal forests? I love it. Uh, let's do it. Um... There's so much opportunity. Here in my neighborhood, uh, an urban naturalist 
wonderful guy, Diamond McPherson, took me outside and made me look down at my feet. And I realized that there were tiny things growing in the cracks of the sidewalk, which I'd never seen. Ruderal vegetation, ruderal meaning ruins, uh, because this was pioneered by, uh, perforce after World War II, by local uh, naturalists who could no longer leave the city because of the Cold War. And so began studying the ruins and realized that the ruins were more biodiverse than the areas they'd loved out in the suburbs. Um, so we can green the grounds, the streets, we can green the sides of buildings with green walls, we can green the roofs of buildings. The, the opportunities are extraordinary. Green walls seem to have been invented, or at least one of the inventors was the writer E.B. White's brother, mm. who was a professor out at the University of Illinois in Champaign. And I found this letter that White had written to his mother saying, uh, everyone has some strange brothers in their families. We got one, but I think he's onto something here. Uh, and he was. Mm. That's fantastic. Um, somebody else asked, when thinking about restoration, how far back are we trying to go? Um, to, uh, for example, Manhattan looks at what Manhattan was like before the Europeans settled, or are we trying to look at before the indigenous people were there? Um, and actually, if you think about it, we have had many previous extinctions. So where, where are we going back to? Or what are we, what's our baseline? of restoration aspiration? Well, I think but we're, we're not going backward to anything. I think we're going forward to something, uh, to the nature of the future. I'm supposed to give a talk at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And what a wonderful thing they've come up with, the idea that they don't just collect dinosaur bones. They collect living landscapes. They call it their living collections. Um, and throughout Northeast Ohio, they are uh, working with lots of other groups and have managed to protect something like 300,000 acres among them. Um, so this is a way of, they're, they're protecting not just natural history, but the nature of the future, the nature of the present and the future. What will be possible? What's needed? One of the people I, found out about when I was working on my book was this remarkable Brit, Brit named Ralph Audi, who came up with the idea of the Ips effect. Hmm. Um, he pointed out that most species like to tinker with the landscape. Most species treat the world as a sort of fixer upper <laughs> to make things a little bit more easy for themselves, a little bit more comfortable. That's why birds build nests, it's why beavers build dams. Well, us humans uh, have taken that beyond what any other species have been up to in creating a world for our benefit. And I think we sometimes get um, blinded by that and thinking that's the only reality and, and, not, and, and harder to see beyond that line of the ips effect, meaning Ips effect meaning a wordy coin meaning made it ourselves, yeah. uh, made it into a fact. Hmm. Uh, but the, the rest of it is still there. So we have a whole political party devoted to ipso facts. Um, <laughs> so by the way, another question, which I'm gonna ask that you respond to later is do you have a list of the most important biology and ecology books? So think about that and we'll post that. We'll, we'll I don't wanna, take up all our time with that now, but um, I'd love for you to, to circulate that. Um, so some other questions, what is the biggest deterrent to all this happening? Funds, lack of imagination, manpower, technology? What, what, um, what's, the, what's the barrier? Well, my book is all is about a raft of people who are not deterred. <laughs> and that was what made the book so enjoyable to work on because I kept running around the country, running around the continent and meeting more and more groups and people who are taking this on as a project to protect land, protect biodiversity uh, through a remarkable range of projects and 
strategies and, and they're just doing it. And this, as I said, one question I get is why half earth? The other question I tend to get is, well, how do I get involved? Well, as I, it's almost impossible not to get involved. <laughs> All you have to do is Google whatever you're interested in and, and someone is going to be working on this. I also like to cite a wonderful environmental planner up in Maine named Ua Amundsen, who says when people ask him that question, um, he says, well, who is the Henry David Thoreau of your area? Who is the Andrew Wyeth of your area? Who has really captured the essence of where you are uh, uh, as a way of helping you think about where it is? Because wherever we are, we're somewhere and we're, nature's still there, whether or not we it's the fact that it out of our heads. Um, so, and, and of course, different people are get uh, conked by different, different aspects of it. It could be seeing an incredible bird. It could be just um, going to the park. It could be looking at a wildflower. It could be almost anything. Uh, Whales have returned to New York Harbor. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, we haven't proclaimed it a national marine park yet, but it is one. So we have another question. I had an opportunity recently to visit a farm in Southern England um, where the beavers had been reintroduced. And the owners regaled us with stories about the North American beavers and their broad destruction by the trappers who sought the valued beaver skins. Do we have any indulgences today like beaver skins that we should curb because of their vital connection to a precious ecosystem? Oh gosh, uh, I'd, I'd have to take notice of that question because I'm sure there's all kinds of fripperies that we uh, don't need. The New York economy was founded on trapping beavers. John Jacob Astor made his fortune by trapping beavers. The Astor Place subway station has a bas relief of beavers to show that this was the foundation of, of New York's uh, fortune and, and empire. Uh, it took a long time to get beyond beavers. Uh, it took a long time to get beyond wearing egret plumes in hats, uh, but, but that led to the first uh, Migratory Bird Conservation Acts 100 years ago. Uh, and as a result, the egrets now uh, patrol the marshes once again. Um, let me think. Oh, can I make a suggestion? Would yes. you refer to you? It, it may be beef. Maybe the, if you think about the destruction of uh, habitat for beef from the waters that come from feedlots and the devastation of places like the rainforest to grow soy and other things to feed the beef. Well, clearly that uh, is a huge drain upon uh, the natural systems. Uh, I, I'm not about to tell people they need to be vegetarian. But, but people seem to be changing their eating habits anyway, uh, as a result of just the facts being presented. Uh, I don't, I, I'm trying to think if there's anything I wear that I ought to discard. Uh, I don't have ermine, I don't have, uh, I'll, I'll keep thinking about that one. You know, what's interesting, what, the, what it points out, though, is because we talked about wolves and we talked about now beaver, um, is that we used to have this concept of what was called the keystone species. And it was the idea that there was everything built up to this, you know, these key species and that they were everything, their role was a bigger, more outsized influence role than others. And now we know it's really much more about a network and a fabric. So we've learned in, enormously in recent years about the value of not only the microorganisms in the soil, but the, the microfungi, the fungi networks that connect trees and then through which they communicate. And 
that uh, so we never would have thought of them as the keystone species, but they're clearly an important one. So I would say we should shift our mind from keystone species to network species. Yes, and I think that's probably part of the thinking why the UN made this the decosis, the decade of the ecosystem, okay. that just beginning now. Um, and I think it's also part of getting beyond our ipsa factual thinking to find signs of intelligence where we never expected to find them. And this whole idea of the wood wide web that the trees in a forest are connected and that they're not only connected, but they are sending uh, nutrients and messages to each other. Uh, and that there are mother trees uh, in, in a forest uh, helping the young seedlings of their own coming along. And, and the woman who is the pioneer of that has just published her own book, which I'm sure will be a huge success because who would have thunk it? Well, we didn't think of it. A tree as something that uh, has some awareness. Um, this is getting pretty pretty goofy, we would have thought, but it it's, turns out to be the truth. So it really means that in many ways, there is a, a consciousness and we always knew that there was, for example, tropism towards sunlight, and that we, but we always thought of these things as almost chemical reactive. We didn't imbue them with a sense of consciousness, but we're now seeing almost a, a consciousness and a willfulness and a choice, not just reaction, but choice that seems to permeate all of nature. Well, um, how do we get in touch with that? That was a question we were dealing with earlier. Um, Mackay had his own ideas. He thought we all needed to be in frequent touch with everything with our, the things we'd made and the things that were natural. Mm -hmm. We needed to be in touch with a na natural landscape. We needed to be in touch with farmed rural landscapes and we needed to be in touch with cities, and urban townscape landscapes. And then his math was one plus one plus one equals four because he thought that that kind of planetary feeling would come into being in, in us once we had, were familiar and stayed familiar with all of the three landscapes, the ones we'd made and the ones that were already there. Um, I think that this kind of sense is very much there in people, but uh, we're only just beginning to think of it as something that's as valuable to us as, as I, I, in one of my books, I called it our Cinderella sense because we grew up hearing that uh, there's two kinds of thinking. There's daydreaming and that's bad. And there's closely reasoned thinking. And we spend 20 years in school training that. But this other idea that just we have awareness of everything around us uh, anyway, and that it is operating on all cylinders all the time, um, doesn't get recognized or nourished in our official training. Uh, so we have to reach out for it elsewhere. But, uh, but I think the planet is hurrying us along now. Uh, this is an urgent time and urgency begets new ideas uh, and new understandings. Uh, we've, we've made a terrible mess, but we're also uh, wonderfully in the process of doing something about that. And that's why I was able to write a hopeful book uh, and as Mackay liked to say, uh, optimism is oxygen. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and once people feel that they can take part and do something positive, uh, the energy flows into them to do it, to do that and to work with other people. So I want to maybe end on this idea of planetary feeling. So can you describe it? more viscerally. Describe it as, well, I love, I'm not gonna tell you to describe it. I'd love for you to describe it. Um, it's really just opening up to what's there, uh, I think, more than anything else. Um, that there are 
that we are part of a, a, a nest or network of places, the, our immediate surroundings, uh, what they lead to, and then something beyond that uh, that has uh, more of a continental and then planetary focus. My book is mostly about North America, but I think that's sort of a good way station, a continental focus uh, that doesn't seem too uh, beyond our reach. Uh, and, and I just find that to, to be helpful in terms of uh, reaching out. When I give talks about the book, I'm always learning things that I wish I'd had in the book. Mm. Uh, because everywhere I go, I try to find out what is happening in that particular area. I mean, did I go virtually because I just sit right here in, in my living room in Manhattan. Um, but, I, but I always ask people what's happening in your area. And, it's, and there are wonderful stories always, uh, wherever it is. Mm. Well, thank you, Tony, so much for joining us today and for this really wonderful conversation. With, rega with regard to planetary uh, feeling, I encourage people to try and imagine, as Tony just said, your place and immerse yourself in it. And then close your eyes and imagine that consciousness spreading bigger and bigger to your region and your state and your country and your continent. And see if you can get it to just imagine it encircling the globe. Um, well, I think it's also then a matter of, of reaching out and you'll find that there are other people who are doing the same damn thing uh, and who are already engaged uh, in a whole series of projects, uh, any one of which may uh, pull you in, uh, that you're not the first person to have had this understanding and realization that it's, it's as I said, I think it's happening because it needs to happen. Uh, and that uh, of necessity, we grow new perceptions. Mm. Of necessity, we grow new perceptions. That's beautiful. We're going to end on that. And I thank you all, the audience, for joining us today. Uh, the Pathway to Planetary Health Forms are offered free of charge. So if you'd like to support our programming, please consider making a donation to the Garrison Institute or sponsoring a conversation. We've had some wonderful sponsors in the past, and we have a number of um, forums coming up with Tim Jackson, David Abram, John Kabat-Zinn, and others. So please visit our website calendar for a full list of upcoming programming and join us. And thank you so much for joining us today, and goodbye.